looking at this topic of flexibility. And uh, we wrapped up the class last time by considering three uh, configurations here for heat exchangers. And we, our aim is to accept variation in our process. So we want to control this temperature, but in the first option, we could only vary stream D's flow rates. So we designed a controller for that. That was shown over there. Uh, last time, we also say, well, what if we can open stream B has to stay constant in terms of its flow rate, but we can only vary stream A's flow, and so we came up with that configuration. Then the third one was an interesting option that sometimes occurs when we cannot vary the flow of A nor the flow of B. Okay, so these are two streams that are in the critical part of the flow sheet in the sense that, uh, let's take a look at it in the context of your methanol flow sheet you're dealing with. You're trying to produce a thousand tons per, per day of methanol. You're feeding a certain mass of biomass or coal, and you've got these gases combusted, and they're feeding through the process. You cannot slow down that flow. Right? We cannot add a valve in that stream to close and open it, because that's going to back up those those uh, that material that we're trying to process. So, in many instances, we have flows that cannot be altered yet we still need to control. And so we came up with this interesting bypass strategy. So this is a common theme. In fact, it's a, we're going to generalize this. But let's take a look at another example. Um, so last, uh, so this is new material. Then slide 22 onwards is new here for this class. <coughs> Consider a situation very similar to before. We're trying to heat up a stream. And this is a stream that by the end of it, we need a fairly high temperature. Okay, so it's it's uh, going to some reactor perhaps, and we need it at a very high temperature. And we found four other streams on our process that we can use to successively heat it up with. Now, bear in mind that these streams that we've picked, they are going to have varying flows. Okay? So these streams here are going to be, have changing flows. They're going to have changing temperatures. Yet, despite that, we need to maintain that outlet temperature. So the same idea as before, what we can do is, uh, if, if we're having these inlet temperatures varying and these flows varying, and we still need to get that temperature to be constant, we can make this work by adding uh, that same <coughs> idea, the bypass, but we'll just do it on the last heat exchange over there. So we'll simply manipulate this bypass flow in order to control that temperature. Now that will work, provided that that last heat exchanger can give us the sufficient heat, right? So uh, in other words, what, what we mean is that even if this valve is fully closed or fully open, we still get the range of, of capacity we need. Now, what if that last heat exchanger is still not sufficient to provide heat input we require then? We're going to have to add an external source of heat after that fourth heat exchange. So heat exchanger one, two, three, and four will get us most of the way there still not quite enough to get to this final temperature. This temperature leaving isn't quite high enough for what we need over here. So this is what I want. So I'm going to add in a small furnace, um, or, or whatever capacity furnace I need to make up the rest of that heat. And then my manipulated variable now will be the fuel flow rate. Okay, so I'll, I'll open and close that fuel valve in order to manipulate and obtain the temperature. So this is going to give me the flexibility I need and get all that tight heat integration, which we want from a sustainability perspective. We like, we like heat exchange and, and heat integration, but um, sometimes it doesn't get us all the way to where we need it to be, so we make it up with an additional heater. If we did have sufficient capacity, we could simply just use that bypass as our swing variable <coughs> to manipulate. Okay, so this is a common theme then in this topic of the course to get the necessary flexibility. We'll often see if we've got a variable we want to achieve at some certain set point, and we're having disturbances that could impact that variable. So, so external variables that impact our process. Well, one way we can keep that control fairly tight in the face of these disturbances is to add a bypass. Remember back from your control course, there's two things that kill a control loop. Okay? Dead time and long response time. 
Okay, so they're, they're kind of, a, a dead time is essentially a long response time, but uh, there, there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, so dead time is simply you open that valve and nothing happens. Your control loop opens the valve a little bit more and still nothing happens. There's this long delay, okay? You then that's when you start to get over control because by the time that response comes through, then you've opened that valve too much and now your control loop then swings to the opposite case. So you're, you're flip-flopping around like that. Uh, long response times, same thing, I, same, same principle, right? You open that valve and it takes a long time. You start to see a small response, but not quite, quite fast. So those two we don't like. But look at this bypass. What do you think the dynamics are on that bypass from a control perspective? Slow dynamics, fast dynamics. Would be fast. You're simply opening a valve, and right away you're going to see a response in that temperature. So the delay between opening a valve and seeing a response at TC is minimal, seconds or milliseconds even. So this is a great way to control this temperature. Contrast that to controlling back over here. Think back. So here I open this valve. What are the dynamics before I see a response at the temperature? A little bit slower, right? You open this valve, you have to wait for this hot stream to interact with the stream coming across. There's a bit of a delay there in that response. Whereas the bypass option, much, much faster dynamics and, um, and, and you can get a better control on that temperature as a result of that. Okay, so this is actually one of the things I will hope that you see over the next six classes where we look through all these topics over here is that you're going to start to see many of the same things coming through, right? So to increase our operating window, very often we make a change to our flow sheet that that change will also give us enhanced flexibility and that same change will get us better dynamic performance. So you often get three or four of these improvements for one single change to your flow sheet. Okay, so um, it's, 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 it's great that we have that actually. It would be awful if it was the opposite, if you improve one at the expense of the other. But in our cases, we're going to see um, the same thing, the same change will improve three or four of these goals over there on the, on the left side. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have to say on flexibility. Um, for those of you that uh, we said last class on Wednesday, we were looking at the bioreactor case study. Here's uh, one way you can get additional flexibility on that, that case. So I'll leave you to work through that example and think through what the purpose of each of these valves are and what they would be controlling in each case. Okay, so back earlier, at a much earlier slide, we had said what our control objectives are. Here is one way to achieve those control objectives. I'll leave it up to you to close the loops. Right, so the bio people know the cause and effect. If you open say substrate, you know what the effect is going to be. Versus if you open the airflow rates to your compressor, you know what the effect is going to be. So bio people can now cause the effect uh, control repairing and, and work through that as okay. So let's uh, take a look then and move on to the next topic, which is reliability. These are the new notes that were posted. Okay, and I don't think uh, we need to explain the justification for this too much, right? We're, we're very comfortable with this. We've seen this in a few of the tutorials. <laughs> Reliability essentially recognizes that for a given flow sheet, if I had a piece of equipment fail on me, so here, for example, I have a pump. Now, pumps fail quite frequently. We're going to show, I'll show you that in a minute. So if that pump fails on me, I am no longer able to maintain control of the liquid level in this tank, nor move material out of the tank over to the flash drum, which gets recycled back here. So that's going to immediately cause me lost sales. I may have to dispose of some material now that's um, unprocessed through this loop here. I'm going to suffer the fact that I may have to shut down some of my units. And I then have to start those units up again, which causes a big expense in terms of heating and cooling, right? So a reactor that's continuously operating is 
is operating at fairly steady state, the moment you shut it down and it goes back to ambient, you have to then start it back up again. It's a big expense that uh, bringing a, a, a reactor back up online. Okay, so some of the, the tanks I've, I've worked with are pretty much the size of this room or, or, or small, just a little smaller. And the jackets on that, there's a tremendous thermal capacity on that. So if you have to bring that jacket back up to, to temperature again, that's a huge energy expense just for a temporary shutdown so that you can replace that pump. Okay? And you obviously have to um, not only shut down this unit, but take a look, for example, if this pump is not flowing anymore, you're no longer exchanging heat in a heat exchanger, and this stream, this hot oil, is maybe needed on another part of the flow sheet, further down or upstream, and now suddenly this hot oil is not coming in at the temperature it needs, so you may it may cascade down to shutting down other parts of your process, or at least suffering uh, poor performance on other parts of your process. Okay. So there's, there's really, it's very easy to justify the fact that we need good reliability. On <coughs> now, if I say the word reliability to you, what are some of the things that come to mind? What do we mean with the term reliability? If your boss says, I need you to make this flow sheet more reliable, what are you going to take from that instruction? You want the process to operate the same way every time you enter similar inputs. You want the process to operate the same way every time you give it similar inputs. Okay, that's that's consistency a little bit. Yeah, okay, I see where you're going. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> what do you what do you mean if some if you say, oh my friend is reliable? I can always count on him or her. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Gets the job done. Gets the job done. Okay. Anything else about that? Is there a time dependency on that? Someone's reliable now, but they're reliable maybe 50 years from now. Okay, so does reliability stay constant in time? Think not of people, but think of equipment. Yeah, so the reliability is going to change as that equipment <coughs> And so there's a time aspect to reliability as well. So here's a definition that you can look at um, and consider. It's probabilities. Um, so it's very much statistically driven, the probability of a device performing successfully. Um, now, we say it has to, there's, we can quantify that probability. We've got a lot of data on our processes and uh, uh, institutes like AICHE, they collect data from multiple companies and they've, they've established reliability databases. So I'll show you some of that data in a minute. Um, now, we want it to be reliable so that it can perform its function. So that clearly depends on how you specify what the function is. But it's also very important that you state under which conditions that function should be performed. So if, if you ever buy a computer or a tablet, if you read the fine print in the manual, it says that that computer works under defined conditions of a certain temperature range and humidity range. We don't expect a laptop or your cell phone to work at 80, 90% humidity on a continual basis, right? So under specified conditions, you'll get a guarantee of a certain amount of reliability. And we, one way we can do that is to say, well, what's the number of times it's failed divided by the total number of times I've used it? So that's essentially a kind of failure pro the probability. One, one minus that is its reliability. So. We want this reliability to be really high, close to one. In other words, the number of failures per number of times you use them should be small. We can also look at, um, so that's probability of failure then. F of t is the, the opposite of reliability. So reliability is what I just defined as one minus um, F of t, essentially. So R, we can say R of t is one minus F. So that's essentially the failure rate. And we can also, uh, sorry, the probability of failure. So we can also define a new, another variable, the failure rate. This is a little bit more intuitive. Uh, ignore this definition down here, but essentially understand it from this units of it. It's the number of failures per unit time. 
and typically we say per million hours. So what's a million hours? It's 114 years. Number of times the device will fail within 114 years <coughs> is, is, a, is a good way that we work with these, um, with these instruments and with our data. So what is the failure rate for your laptop computer? Any numbers? It's only failed once in four years. So failure rate in 114 years. Think of um, <coughs> piping. Right. Piping and wiring in your house. So if you live in a house in Westdale, those houses are typically in the order of about 100 years old, 80 to 100 years old. So what's the, those wires are still working pretty well, right? They haven't failed yet. What scale is failure? Because like in the sense of a computer, if your computer crashes, is that considered a failure? Or if it's like if a piece of equipment dies to the point where you have to replace it, is that a failure? Yeah, so it comes down to this. It's like, is it doing its function okay. under a given condition? So a crash is, okay. is a failure, okay. right? So it's not just that you can't turn it on anymore. That's also a failure. It's not doing what it's intended to do is a failure. Okay, so what, we, what you'll typically find is that failure rates have this bathtub shape or bathtub curve where there's a period of time where you just break in that piece of equipment and you iron out some of the glitches with it. So the failure rate during that initial period is fairly high. It stabilizes during most of its life. And then as it nears the end of its life, the failure rate goes back up again. So this is a typical curve. And the main point I want you to take from this is that this gamma t, I'm uh, sorry, lambda t is a function of time. The failure rate is not a constant. So this is a plot here of lambda, lambda t. It's not a constant. So let's take a look at what some failure rates are. Um, so over here, what some of the worst failure rates are over here. These are failures that are in the order of 100 to 1,000 to even 10,000 times in 100 odd years. So in a million hours, these sorts of equipment are, have very high failure rates. Pumps and compressors right over there. Okay? So a pump as low as, as say 50, 100, 1,000 times in a 100 year life. So that's a pretty, pretty substantial number of failures that you'd expect. Electronics, computers are all over here. Why do you think computers are so failure prone? I think of a computer, what happens inside it? What in this failure? Why is it so error prone or failure prone? relative to, say, something like vessels or um, pipes. Pipes are over here. Pipes are some of the lowest failure items. Wiring, resistors, so electronic parts. There's a tremendous complexity. It's made up of, of many of these things over here that have low failure. If you combine them all together, and now you get high failure. And what is it about that equipment setup that makes it so failure prone? Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. But think about what we may not get it in today's class, but we'll certainly look at it on Tuesday. Um, so we can also go to ASCHE's database. They've compiled. Um, so over here, they compile data on selected equipment. And if we look up the page on rotating equipment, particularly for compressors, we can see here that the number of failures per million hours aggregated over a large sample is as low as three failures, as high as 5,600. But on average, the mean is 1,400 failures. So compressors, some of the, the most high levels of failure uh, back here again. So compressors were. Pumps and compressors over here. This is some of the most high, highly, highly prone to failure. One other thing just to note that that's superscript 7. 
refers to the fact that this table does not include equipment designed for the nuclear industry. So the nuclear industry will specify equipment and, and have, have it manufactured so that it has much, much lower level of failure. Okay, so uh, we, again here we don't need to go through some of the mathematics, but one interesting parameter is if you take this failure rate and you invert it, you get what we call the mean time to failure. Failure rate inverted, um, average time between the device being placed in operation and its first failure. So we'd like this to be high or low? High. Mean time to failure. So in other words, equipment with a low, small gamma, we will have a high mean time to failure, and that's desirable. One other thing to bear in mind is that we, uh, just some other terms that you'll see in this, in this industry is mean time to failure. There's also mean time to repair, MTTR, and MTOW, mean time of waiting for spare parts and for that equipment to be, to be fixed up. Uh, so if you sum up those three times and divide it uh, in the denominator and you put it in the mean time to failure in the numerator, that's availability. So we'd like that to be high. But you can see how uh, that can be high, yet still have a piece of equipment that's not working as it is intended. Here's an example that Dr. Marlon has put in his notes. A computer failure is, uh, it might have a long time to, to, fail, uh, to failure, but if it's MTTR, mean time to repair and mean time to wait are very low, in other words, that would mean like a computer that reboots very quickly after a failure, um, then you still get high availability. So, we're saying it's very quick to reboot, the mean time to repair and mean time for waiting is very small. This still is close to one. You've got good availability, but that's still not desirable. That computer system continually rebooting and resetting is not, not a useful device. So what we typically aim for, and it again varies in different industries, but we typically will aim for 361 days of the year operation in many chemical processes. It's a four or five days per year of a shutdown. Um, some companies will turn around or maintain the process every two years, so they'll have a 10 day shutdown every two years. Um, other industries vary, right? So again, it's not, it's not a, a continuous number, it's not always that number. And industries that work with primarily batch processes, they'll be maintaining their process anytime the batch is not run. So it's, it's different there as well. What you'll be using for a project? Yeah, it's not going. It's going to wash out in the error <laughs> for your yeah. project. Yeah, for thirty years. Uh, but if you want to do a more careful analysis, you could use it like of in the order of five to ten days shutdown. So this is what we aim for. Uh, we ideally like our equipment so that we can maintain it during that up that shutdown period. Um, so what I, what I mean by that is. We, we know that we can never get 100% availability, but how can we get as close to that as possible? Well, one of the ways we can do, do that is perform maintenance, preventative maintenance um, and repairs on that equipment, and we can do that during the shutdown period. So that's going to boost our availability because then we can increase that, that mean time to failure goes higher and higher if we keep our, if our, if we keep our equipment maintained. Uh, other ways that companies will do it is that they'll have a fairly substantial break-in period, so this commissioning phase. During commissioning, you'll move this process to all sorts of operating conditions and extremes that you would never normally use in practice. So that's actually a good thing. Firstly, you you're starting to understand how your equipment works, and then you're moving it to very extreme forms of operation. And kind of like you're driving that new car off the car, and then you go at high speed around corners on really slippery roads, and you're kind of pushing the capability of the car just to see what, it's, what it can do. But under normal conditions, that's not how you use it. Same, same idea for commissioning. You move a process to extreme operations that you don't really operate at, and, and you're using that to uncover failure modes. The other thing that's very important is you'll see in all companies of a reasonable size, they'll have a spare parts storage on site where they'll always keep one or more items in stock 
so that you're not waiting for that spare gasket or that spare part from the supplier that may take five to ten days to put you put you behind shape. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at some ways that we as engineers can proactively improve reliability on the process. So these are some things you've seen before. Take uh, take some time here, and we're going to work through them. Uh, we need to replace or remove an equipment without stopping part production. That's our goal. To improve reliability, we want to keep, keep going. In this example where there's only one pump, we can switch between the two of them. So if we only need one pump at a time and we put two in parallel, we can work on one while the other is going. We've seen the case with valves before. Okay, and we've, we've likely seen the case of heat exchange. So we'll, let's work through these. Take a minute and add any elements to that piping diagram that you'll need to improve the reliability. <coughs> so as shown there, that's not going to get you reliability. What do you need to add to it? Add a check valve after each pump. of the check valves. They prevent backflow. But why don't I add there, for example? Right, so if this pump is down, you're replacing it, and this pump is keep running, you don't want flow to be sent this way. And so we put a check valve on all those lines over there to isolate them. If you have a hammer out there, why do you need the check valve? Yeah. Yeah. just take sort of standard. Okay, if you've got the hand valves there, why do you need the check valves? Because the um, hand valve will be kept open, but it doesn't prevent backflow. Hand valve will be kept open, but it doesn't prevent backflow. Um, what maybe I can suggest? It, yeah. Is it because like if you close the first one off, you're going to prevent any flow coming out of your pump? 
Yeah, because you don't want backflow. Like, if you have a check out there, you have backflow, and you try and close it, and all the flow possibly going against it. So you said it again, you close. So, so you want the check out because if, if it wasn't there, you should try and close the hand off with the possibility of flows from coming into it. Flows from coming back to you? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so during just to shut it down. The other reason why you'll see this situation is because upstream, yeah, uh, we don't always know what's, I mean, this example is very isolated, right? But in, in many processes, what's upstream, there might be tanks over here and other vessels with fluid in there. And if you shut both of these pumps down, then you can get backflow, especially if that's at a higher elevation. Okay, so this will prevent any backflow on the, in a situation where under normal operation and you shut these two pumps down. So during, as you're going into shutdown or some other shutdown of the process, then you don't want this uh, material flowing back at you. But if you, if you shut the pumps down, both hands off will close. Yeah, but you're relying on someone to actually proactively go close those handbells. So this comes back to this principle of making sure that changes to your process don't lead to inadvertent bad behavior. Kind of like this IKEA principle. You just can't screw it up. Right, so a hand a check valve will just not allow that actual action. Okay? So for those of you that have, I mean there's some check valves just to illustrate the principle. So under regular flow, it's flowing up this way, and if that flow stops, there's not sufficient force to push that string back, and so that ball will fall into place over there. It will get pushed into place. And another option is there's so many different types of this type. See, so here, there's, it's spring-loaded flaps that will then open up under flow and then close back up again. So if you've got back flow, it pushes it shut and keeps it shut. So different technologies, and there's several other options available for that. OK, so check valves, hand valves to improve the reliability. So after this course, you may want to go open businesses for valves and sensors, because you're starting to see it's just everywhere, right? Let's take a look at, at another one you've seen before. We won't go through this one again, other than to just show, again, here, if this important control valve up here in black is going to leak, and they will periodically fail on us, there's, there's high failure rates on those relative to some other instruments. Uh, those valves move up and down continually all day, and then they don't always seat properly, and they need to be changed if they fail. Uh, what we'll then do is close and isolate it, and then have a hand valve there that will be manually controlled by an operator for the hour or so that it takes to replace that other valve. So we've seen that one before. What else do we add to this heat exchanger to improve its reliability? So it's fouled and we need to take it out of service. We don't want to shut down the process again. Diagram any additional piping and valves or other equipment that you believe will be useful to you. keep your process operational for a period of time. Keep it down. So that while this is out of service, this stream can still move around. 
Okay, so what we're essentially saying is we're going to accept the fact that we're not able to cool that stream for a period of time, but it, it's, it's probably okay, or the downstream equipment can take care of it in some, some way in a sub -op. We're going to produce probably some suboptimal product, or not quite what we want, but at least we don't have to shut down the process, which will be a whole lot more costly. There's a bypass over there. Anything else? No. Two valves. Two valves on the inlets. Oh, one, here, one, there. one there, one there. And check valves on the exits. Check valves at the exits, just in case there's backflow at us. Okay. Uh, so, again, depend, uh, the, the need for check valves is context dependent. Uh, certainly, valves over here to isolate the heat exchanger on all, um, on all the entrances and exits. And then the bypass, why might, why might we have a valve on the bypass over there? Okay, so while the unit is in operation, we don't want material flowing around the bypass. Would you look at a real like world scenario, would you actually would you put another heater in that would like be part of the bypass and you heat it up, or would you just accept the fact that you can't heat up or cool down whatever you have to do that stream? Yeah, so the question is in a, in, in in a case that you would actually add in a second heat exchange. <coughs> Any thoughts on that? Depends on the process. Yeah. Depends on the process, right? And the criticality of that stream being at the temperature. And I'll show you an example of that. What, what are you essentially doing when you're adding in a second heat exchanger? Are you doing it in series or in parallel? Parallel. Okay, so hold that thought. We'll hopefully get to today, then maybe tomorrow. Um, Tuesday at least. So what we're going to look at, we've recognized here that we cannot take the equipment out of service while it's being repaired. We want to be able to repair it while it's it's going, okay? So what you're starting to see is you need many more valves and potentially parallel equipment to keep this operation. So think of it this way, right? What we're essentially we're asking to do is imagine trying to do maintenance on your car while it's driving, right? That's what we're trying, that's our goal here. Keep our process running, but still do maintenance on it as, as it's doing, as it's, as it's operating. Essentially, we're adding tools or equipment or valves or piping so that we're able to achieve that goal. So let's take a look at this. Um, a, a process is a series of complex units, and they're connected in a very complex way. Not always as simple as shown over here, but these are the two essential ways we can uh, chain up a process, so either in series or in parallel. <laughs> Which of those two do you see as being more reliable? That feel? Parallel? Okay. So it comes down to this principle, absolutely right, that a series circuit or a series of functions, as long as each component is independent of the other, so component two's failure doesn't cause a failure in one, or failure in one doesn't cause a failure in somewhere else. In other words, they're independent units. So this would be like a heat exchanger followed by a reactor. The reactor's failing won't affect the heat exchanger if they're independent of each other. Um, then we say that the reliability is the product of all the reliabilities in the series circuit. So this is essentially, we, we know that expression in English, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. It's an expression of that. Right? So take the weakest component, the, the lowest reliability, and that's going to determine and affect the reliability of the entire circuit. So coming back to the computer case, that's why computers are so unreliable, despite the fact that their individual components are highly reliable. If it's a series, you've got your RAM, your hard drive, there's a series of circuits in that computer. Whereas, well, let's, before we go to parallel circuits, then think of some cases of series circuits in a chemical process. Right? Many flow sheets, the methanol synthesis flow sheet that you guys have been dealing with, each of the groups has been pretty much in a series. Right? So you've got your gasification, methanol, uh, the scrubbers, and then, uh, sorry, gas, gasification, water gas shift, scrubbers, and then uh, methanol synthesis. There's no big recycle loop back. There's no parallel processing in that uh, diagram. 
Okay, so many of our processes we can we can chunk up as a sequence of series circuits, and everything has to be operating for that circuit to be working. Here's another example of a series circuit. It's um, it's at the very detailed level. If we consider this tank, we're measuring its temperature. It's 145 degrees Celsius, but our thermocouple is measuring a millivolt signal. That millivolt signal then um, gets converted down to analog to a transmission line. So we're transmitting that signal to an A to D converter. There's another series element. That digital signal then goes to a digital computer control system that will then determine and calculate the action to take on this valve. So we to calculate that value and send that signal down D to A converter, convert that digital signal to analog. So there's another series element. Then we convert that to a pressure to act on that valve opening. So it's a sequence of series elements. If any one of those elements breaks in that chain, that control loop is broken. So we require high reliability on every single one of these elements in order to get an overall high reliability. Let's look at parallel circuits then. Parallel circuits, we can cal calculate the reliability of the overall parallel circuit by saying it's essentially, we call back from earlier, we said reliability is one minus failure. Well, failure here in this case is the product of each of the individual failures. So here's the failure of the first unit up there, and the second unit failure is one minus R2. The, for a, a parallel circuit to fail, you require both of those units to fail simultaneously. So failure of one unit multiplied by the failure of the second unit, that gives you failure there. And then so the overall reliability of the parallel circuit is one minus the combined failure. If we chain up multiple uh, elements in parallel, by that I mean we've got one, two, three, four, five, several in that vertical stack over there, we can say that overall reliability is the product of those, one minus r's, and then we subtract one from that again. So what I'd like you to then take a look at is take a look at this circuit over here and consider each box to have a reliability of 90% and calculate the overall reliability of that circuit as a result. <coughs> Okay, so 
72% for the first, 92% for the next one, and then 97 for the third one. Okay? Notice that the difference between option B and C is you're not buying any new equipment. You're simply changing the piping configuration and you get an additional 5% reliability just from, from clever piping. Okay. So an example of this would be like if you're making bread, you need to mix the bread, then you need to bake it, and then you need to slice and package it. So your mixing, baking, and slicing machines are all independent of each other. If you chain them up in this way, you, you mix, bake, slice on one production line, you mix, bake, slice on the second production line. Okay, but if one, what if this, if the baking, if the oven goes down on the first production line, you can still mix, bake, and slice on the second line. But it, on this third option, you mix, bake, slice, mix, bake, slice. But let's say one of these elements goes down, you can always go across and then back up again. Okay, so you get that improved reliability just from that in interesting piping layout. Okay, so there's the calculations up there for how the numbers were computed, if you didn't uh, get those calculations. But understand then that, well, this first one has no redundancy. The second one option is what we call system level redundancy. So this entire system is made redundant a second time. And this third option is what we call module level redundancy. Each module is redundant. So I'll leave it at this, this point and we'll take it from here on Tuesday. There is a tutorial on Monday. The tutorial on Monday will cover the topics on reliability that you've been looking at the past few classes and the next coming classes.